Welcome to our August installment of the Emily Dickinson Museum's new reading series, Phosphorescence. To Dickinson, phosphorescence was a divine spark and an illuminating light behind learning. Dickinson's descriptions of phosphorescence reveal an understanding of its chemical volatility. For her, to be phosphorescent was to be more than illuminating. It was to be transformative, alchemical. This series of virtual readings runs monthly now through December, bringing you established and emerging poets from all over the world, working in diverse styles from a range of backgrounds, but all reading powerful poems that contain a transformative spark. Tonight, we will hear their work and then share a conversation with them about contemporary poetry and Emily Dickinson's legacy. My name is Elizabeth Bradley, Emily Dickinson Museum Program Manager, and I am here with Brooke Steinhauser, the Program Director. Brooke, do you want to say hello? Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us. We're thrilled to be here. Yes, thank you, Brooke. And we both want to thank you so much for tuning in. Since we can't hear or see your applause tonight, we do hope you'll consider sharing words of affirmation and appreciation in the chat during the readings. You can actually start uh, participating right now by telling us where you are coming from. So if you want, uh, you can just type in, in the chat where you're coming from tonight. And I'm joining you from my house in, in Northampton, Massachusetts. We will also take a few minutes at the end of the program for conversation with these poets. So feel free to participate by adding questions to the Q&A feature as we go. And one last note, we will be enabling Zoom's auto transcription feature this evening, which generates closed captioning to the best of a computer's ability. So as this is not a live captioner, there will be some errors in transcription along the way you may choose to use or to not use this feature. So to turn it off um, or on, just go to the live transcript button at the bottom of your toolbar. And this full program um, will last one hour. So we have a real treat for you this evening. Uh, we will hear from three poets whose work draws on real and imagined encounters with the natural world to explore different themes, themes of loss, longing, the fragility and permanence of place. Their writing even takes us to two different deserts, the American Desert Southwest and the Antarctic. Um, we see that you are joining us from many places. I'm seeing Florida and Germany and California. So we hope you enjoy this poetic excursion wherever you are. And now I will introduce our poets. W.J. Herbert's debut clo poetry collection, Dear Specimen, was chosen by Kwame Dawes as a winner of the 2020 National Poetry Series, selected by Natasha Trethewey for inclusion in Best American Poetry 2017. Her work also appears or is forthcoming in The Atlantic, Hudson Review, Pleiades, Southwest Review, and elsewhere. She lives in Kingston, New York, and Portland, Maine. Dennis Jane Sweeney, it is the author of the Antarctic Circle, winner of the 2020 Autumn House Rising Writer Prize and forthcoming in March 2021, as well as four chapbooks. His poem has appeared in the New York Times, Prelude, Poor Claudia, Quarterly West, and Territory, among others. A small press editor of Entropy, he has an MFA from Oregon State University and a PhD from the University of Denver. Originally from Cincinnati, he lives in Amherst, Massachusetts. And finally, um, Mary Robles is from El Paso, Texas and grew up in the Northeast Ohio. Robles holds a BFA in creative writing from Bowling Green State University and was the recipient of a 2016 Creative Workforce Fellowship from the Community Partnership for Arts and Culture in Cleveland, Ohio. Robles' most recent poetry publications include Glass Mountain, New England Horror Writers Wicked Women Anthology, and Salt Hill. And now I will turn it over to you, WJ. Hi, thank you so much, Elizabeth and Brooke and the Emily Dickinson Museum for hosting uh, Dennis and Mary and I this evening. And thank you, those of you who are listening, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I'd like to open with Emily Dickinson's number 1157. 
uh, some days retired from the rest in soft distinction lie, the day that a companion came or was obliged to die. I love the intimacy of this lyric, the way Emily invites us in to share a quiet moment with friends, with the ever presence of death um, and the fact, you know, bringing to our attention the fact that um, we will um, have to part with those we love. Um, the book that I'm going to read from this evening is um, Dear Specimen. Um, it's a meditation on um, personal mortality and species extinction. There are three braided themes in the book. The first is a dying speaker who's trying to come to terms with her impending death. Uh, and she looks at the animals around her and at those specimens that she sees in museums and collections. And she sort of sees in them an emotional landscape uh, that she's feeling. She's trying to understand what it feels like to be dead. So that sounds a little morbid, but actually um, she looks at the beauty and fragility of, of the animals um, and also thinks about their um, brutality from time to time. The second thread is uh, contemplating the vastness of geological time. At this point, she starts to talk to fossils um, trying to understand what it feels like to be extinct. Um, and while she's doing this, she's coming to terms with the fact that our species may soon join the many extinct species in the previous extinction events. Um, and she's um, contemplating our culpability for this crisis. The third theme is uh, a series of dialogue poems between the dying speaker and her daughter. She knows that um, her death is going to be a blow and she's somehow trying to soften it if she can. Um, but she's also concerned about the kind of world that she's leaving her daughter and um, her grandson. The first poem, um, all you need to know is that her daughter's name is Sarah and that she's had a series of miscarriages to this point. Seamless bead. Smooth and cool, with a streak the color of fog broken by a coastline. The dove's egg, because Sarah was pregnant again, seemed to be a gift wrapped in sticks that fell away. And I worried that a crow might carry away a wind's lift. This wisp of would-be belly and bone, shucked pea, its heart still beating. In the next poem, the speakers had an echocardiogram the day before, uh, and she's going to speak to a fossil from the late Cretaceous, a Mosasaurus, who is an apex marine predator of, of that era. It became extinct with the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, but it was very successful um, for tens of millions of years. Um, there is an epigraph written by the theologian Paul Tillich. It goes, the asking subject in every question already has something of the object about which he asks, otherwise he could not ask. A homo sapiens on the brink of extinction speaks to the fossil Mosasaurus. If you could lunge from a cave with your whip bait tail, shock a seabird with your strike, then bit by bit with its belly in your grip, swallow it whole. Why didn't you survive? Even now your stone slick bones frighten me. Moza, Lord of the late Cretaceous, though there's nothing left of you but these few bleached runes, you seem alive and I'm dying. Yesterday, as if a fossil had come to life, I watched my ribs lift. Though what appeared on the black and white screen seemed a skeletal outline with no fleshy remnant. As if I hadn't disappeared completely, but left a signal so that far into the future, 
someone might puzzle over me the way I'm puzzling over you. So the collection is fraught with peril throughout. The speaker's illness is everywhere present um, and the planet's peril is also. Um, and this, by now this, the speaker's daughter has had a baby um, whose name is Seth and he's about four or five when he starts having nightmares. And so she, she calls her mother asking, um, asking her to tell Seth a bedtime story. And this one is about uh, manatees, which is a, a, an aquatic mammal, um, a sea cow is its nickname. Uh, and this, the species spoken of here is the West Indian manatee that's endangered right now. There's three species, but only one of them is endangered um, because they're so gentle. They graze eight hours a day on seagrass and they have uh, solid bones so that their body will be heavy, heavy enough to stay submerged while they graze. After his nightmare, Sarah asks, will you tell him a bedtime story? Once a manatee and her calf swam in a lagoon where herons and egrets feed. What do they eat, he asks. Manatees eat seagrass, but the calf is so young that it suckles its mother. And once there was a boy who paddling his kayak would watch water lap over their great gray backs. Seth's quiet. Before he was born, Sarah, heavy bones seemed to float, undulating to ebbs and swells, as if the moon too was impatient for a baby. Now by a Skype, I see them snuggling. Above his bed, a dangling sun, Venus, Mars, Earth so adrift in the dark, Seth seems uneasy beneath it. Does he imagine fevered soil, poisoned seagrass? Mom, finish the story. I don't know how it ends, Sarah, I say. But the boy loves the manatees' whiskered faces, flippers tipped with fingernails like his. And he wonders if the calf feels as drowsy as he does and where the tide's cradle will carry them. So the speaker does die and her daughter is left uh, with grief and she begins to ask the same sort of questions that her mother was asking. Um, and she is looking at some photos of the Mariana Trench, which is six miles deep, the deepest trench in the ocean. It's a landscape of loss, it's sparse, um, and there are only some bioluminescent creatures there. Um, so at the seafloor exploration exhibit, Sarah asks, ghost fish, tail flapping like a translucent scrap of linen in the wind, flag of surrender with a spine inside, eyes riding on slow light through the deep ocean's darkness. Do you know what my mother was looking for? Why she came to you with questions, though you are here only in photos. And as it failed, her heart worked hard. And so she was always tired. Did she imagine what you might know of the dark zones? Trenches erased by time, as sediments drift to the seafloor, carrying the dead who fall to feed you, you whose nights and days are spent near vents that release the heat of what lies deeper. Please tell me what you told her. And the last poem I'll read is um, American Beaver. Uh, when I was living in Catskill along the Hudson, the beaver beaver would paddle every morning from one place to another. I don't know where the beaver was going, but I waited and loved seeing him or her paddle every day. It was wonderful. Um, and the species name is Castor canadensis. And the kits are the 
named for the baby beavers. And just so you know, there was once a giant beaver large as a black bear that roamed during the Pleistocene in North America. American beaver. I love you, Castor. I can't help myself. I don't know if it's because you gnaw whatever you need, then for months fall into a deep almost sleep, the way your cousin did through Pleistocene winters, while woolly mammoths froze in sinkholes. I love your slender paws and pudgy face, how you swim nose up in the Hudson amid PCBs and cadmium, but Castor, it's your tail that puts me over the top, the way you waggle back and forth, smashing the water to warn kits away from bobcat, angered barge leaking tar sands. Thank you. Hello, friends. Um, WG, that, that was amazing. I really enjoy listening to those poems. Um, and I, I really appreciate getting to read with you, getting to read with Mary um, and Brooke, Elizabeth, everyone at the Emily Dickinson house. This is so wonderful. Um, thank you for making it happen. And thank you everybody for coming. I'm gonna read an Emily Dickinson poem to um, starting with water, ending with snow, um, maybe the water of W.J.'s beaver. Water is taught by thirst, land by the ocean's past, transport by throw, peace by its battles told, love by memorial mold, birds by the snow. And I pasted the text to that into the chat. So for me, that poem is about a lot of things, but one thing it's about is what's behind the snow, um, what leads to the snow or what the snow leads to or the complement of this sort of large white expanse. And I have written this book called In, In the Antarctic Circle um, that is kind of inhabiting a snowy space like that, a place that um, implies a lot of other spaces but is mostly confining itself to the Antarctic continent. And to sort of lead us there, I like to start with some blank spaces. So this space is intentionally left blank. And this space intentionally hints at loss. And this space revokes all other spaces. And this space is a wall, an obliteration, a step. This space is without the features of a space, and yet this space is where we aren't together. This space holds a space named after it with no name. Left blank, this space freezes over. This space discovers thinness, a breach, this page is a continent. This page is a door. So I invite you to step through the door with me into this Antarctic continent and listen to some of these poems that are named after coordinates, some of which might be identifying particular places in Antarctica um, that you could find on Wikipedia, some of which might be places that you could not find anywhere, even if you had a compass and a hole crew of people um, because they're just random spots in the middle of the continent. So trying to really inhabit that space where you don't know where you're going, but you're somewhere. In the Antarctic circle, a main concern is self-husbandry, cutting dark chops from the dark sky, identifying lifelong manacles, feeling for the key, suspending paper katydids from the ceiling at just the right angle. The difference between Hank's breath and the hot light breeze of the radiator. They trigger different flights. At times you can't tell whether the wings are held aloft by a string from the ceiling or whether the house is held together by the wings all through the string. Other points are moot 
as yet. We wander out each day. Death is far from the question. We cut holes in the ice and sip history out of it. Afterward, they weigh us. The scale doesn't register. They tag our ears and send us back. No loss to us, our steps are lighter underneath the past. The snow gives less, has less to give. At home, the dome cradles us back into our short, ugly memories. The ancient lives rise and gather blackly at the ceiling. We can't help but cower. Our fathers are there somewhere, breathing hard. Their voices are magnets. Our voices are echoes, kindling fame. Our story is the story of 10,000 men and a sprinkler system and a sudden freeze. Our story is the story of a cowlick gone to heaven and punished there. Our story halts outside the gates, wraps its fingers around the gates, is arrested for protesting the gates, is bailed out by its rich mother. Our story grows facial hair inch by inch. Sirens gaze out from between the strands of our wandering beards. It's best not to shave, Hank and I agree. Something inside is wailing. That thing can wait. It should wait. It knows us like the cold knows the back of our necks. So you can tell that there's some people in these poems and those people are not me. Um, there are two people named Hank and somebody with no name who's telling the poems um, and they're in Antarctica and they're doing something different than what a lot of people who have gone to Antarctica have done. A lot of people who have gone have tried to conquer it or explore it or discover something or um, maybe even find themselves. And in the case of these two fictional people, they're actually just forced to live there, to stay there, which very few people do. I actually heard a story recently about some people who are at the South Pole since the beginning of the pandemic or even before that, they were only finally able to leave and return to a place that wasn't Antarctica. Um, two years at the South Pole is a lot. And these poems are trying to figure out what's it mean if you have to stay there. 65 degrees, 16 minutes south, 103 degrees, six minutes east. First, the little toe, the big one next. Everything between sufferance upon sufferance, our pleasure shivers toward the cluttered sea. My father told me once while my mother shook her head, tickling is nothing less than a gesture at the beyond. Do you hear that? God's salesman knocking at the door. Hank shrieks and kicks at me. I know what his body is saying. There are more empty spaces than there are ways to fill. But that's an inborn fault. I don't stop. We don't have an uncle yet, and I'm not sorry. Windows, we don't even have those. I'll stop when I can see the snow from inside the snow. The dark sector is a real place in Antarctica. 74 degrees, 35 minutes south, 111 degrees west. The only way to get to the dark sector is to trudge. Titanium fills your cheeks. Formlessness tackles you and rubs snow in your eyes until you can see her. The dim promise of a new year lingers on the horizon, but you'd rather someone cut a hole in the sun and fish you out, fed you to their family of five and loved you for what you are, which is a mass of mostly bone. What flesh you have you owe to the winter. Your shape is the shape of stone. Your smile is someone else's whim. Your trust is back with Hank. He hovers above it, as brittle as a shoreline. The living room lifts him up with its thick gray fingers and plucks his ribs out one by one. My hands are shaking at the thought of him suspended there. You think the cold is cold. Emptiness is only a beginning. Emptiness is a simple, ready receptacle.
had to have a little fun with these. So I had to imagine what would happen if all the Earth's bats uh, slept in a different way than they do. <laughs> I, you know, I'm so far removed from some of these poems that I just come upon them. I'm like, wow, where did this come from? Um, and, and it's cool to be strange to my own work. I appreciate it. Um, for me, it's new every time. So I really appreciate this opportunity to read for you and with you um, because every time I read them, they're new poems. This is 66 degrees, 15 minutes south, 121 degrees, 30 minutes east. All of the Earth's bats are right side up, sleeping off the fight. They turn white in their hibernation. They won't speak and don't have the language, but they are somewhere near, I know. Sweep the ceiling, sweep the house, sweep the table, Hank's hair in our jumpsuits where we sweat or stone of a bed. I'll turn to the ice soon, sweep it. Push away the sugar snow until I find their den of warmth and dark leathery life. Still the bats won't come. Their peeping eyes are shut tight for once. They wait it out and they know I'll cave first. Hank risks glances at me. He's afraid to raise his hands to warn me against the collapse we both know is calling. I will bite him, he knows I will. Yes, that's the day the bats will wake. You can wake to the glow of landing lights arranged in a okay. Air traffic goes pioneering a runway site for faith. A savior touching down at the helm of a 787. You're gonna be fine, you say. You're translucent already. An accidental harpoon swing, the quick drop of the sun, an unattached wind at just the wrong moment. Nobody's to blame for these things. Your gauze, you keep on saying, looks as healthy as sickness gets. I can see it now. We'll march down the runway stairs and scoop up armfuls of soil, spread it on our bones. I told you once that God meant for us to connect the dots. I take it back. My innermost organs, bright, and heavy are praying for collapse to deliver them. I'm gonna read you two more. This is called 64 degrees, 44 minutes south, 62 degrees, 37 minutes west. Once we rise, we rise quickly as if a massacre is occurring under our feet. The ground fills the window, touches us from a distance, becomes clear in its blankness, no longer needing to lie. The long plane writes itself the first time in years we survive. We dream we've already been saved. The snow outside is our blanket. In other landscapes, howitzers roll across hills and lock in place, preparing to leave huge furrows. The Antarctic circle heaves and contracts around us. Its touch is bigger than anyone knew. It strides into outer space, strokes the stars, calls them by our names. And I'm gonna read us one more. It's kind of an outro, um, the opposite of an intro, an outro, in that we have Antarctica, but we also have the houses or the spaces or the homes or the rooms that we might be in. For me, I've been in a lot of rooms recently and not a lot of outdoor spaces. And so I'm thinking too about how the white walls and the blank spaces and the time that kind of spreads out. Sometimes it seems like infinitely uh, can be a continent and can also be a home. I'm thinking this too, because of the Emily Dickinson house, all that it holds just up the street, um, the capaciousness of a building, the capaciousness of a place to live. I live in a house that is your name, but I forget your name. The grass out front is as green as snow. The single breadth in me reaches across the outer breadth, an infinite expanse of cubic desire, but I can only hold breadth for so long. After I lean on my walls, they attribute meaning to the skin. They pull back when I pull away. Memory is short. There is something between me 
and it. Something in the shape of a continent, a bulge and a reach. It is blank, but it is there. Thank y'all so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. Um, I'm Mary Robles. Uh, thank you so much to the Emily Dickinson Museum for giving us this chance to be here and to read our poems in the name of Emily Dickinson. Um, it's an honor to be here with everyone and to read with Wendy and Dennis. Uh, I don't have a book to share, but I'll share some poems from an unpublished manuscript called The Great Choya. This is named after a type of cactus that grows in the desert Southwest. Um, a lot of my poems are about family members, many who passed away, many who I've never met. Um, and I think a lot of us know that when you start to do that and learn about people like that in your life, um, you can really form an intense connection with them by just kind of opening yourself to them and learning their stories and really welcoming them into your own life. Um, my favorite uncle, Mario, passed many of these stories down to me, so I thank him for that. Um, and so to maximize reading time, I'm just kind of going to go from poem to poem because a lot of mine are very short and I think they can be kind of taken like individual stories on their own. Um, so again, thank you all for being here with us. The first choya. Kemar, Kemar, the choya is a skull. The big skull was full of brains and soupy entrails bubbling in their brown juices when the spine who licked the plantains and the sugar cane at Christmas, even in the bitter desert wind, wandered down the mountain looking for a good time. The spine curled and slipped itself within the bloody pot, bubbling up and boiling hot, and there within found its slippery cure, the slickest squirming punishment. It was from there the spines came and learned the love of choke chain pain now the choya roves the roads, wanting flesh, and grows all over Texas. How a chili gets born. When the doctor cut me out of my mother, he sliced into my head like part of a joke. They stitched me and gave me to my family like a little spayed dog. And so right away, I had a funny story. My mom was from Ohio, and that was funny enough in El Paso, where my father came from. I was born in a hospital cut into the bottom of the mountain. And when I see it now, it looks like a war veteran's home sitting near the purple shadow, a child at her grandmother's hem. So now I see this chili pepper getting born in my backyard where I squat a grown woman about to turn 33 when the big snows come. And it seems to me it wears its tiny flower like a cap, then suddenly twists away with a new head of dangerous green a weapon, a horn, and dangles free. Check Mex. We came from the desert with our Apache brand fireworks to the bitter middle where the corn is grown. We were from the desert with our wrinkled jean jackets and our chili pepper quilt. And going to the fish houses, we would catch the watery eye of old men with gnarled Ohio hands and filthy ball caps who would say, what are they, some kind of Indians? And I couldn't see my face and I swung my feet in circles and my grandparents hotly speaking Spanish in whispers I still cannot understand. We came from the desert to the lake and the soft grass, not realizing the fire could follow us. My father took a job as a security guard and we would go to camp out on his shifts. He said, when you're cool, the sun never sets. We'd watch nighttime TV and wear our sunglasses. And when our house, not the lake house, burned down, my mother unfolded a long white gown that never stopped and brought the beams down with her tears. Snow white, try to get in. The house is burned. Take a break to count your skins. Everyone lifts like dolls among the sleeping papers, plum lights of wattis, coyote brain, pierogi mush in the confusing music. You can't stop smelling burning and you don't speak the language and you sling your bag and slink away, jealous of the Indians to dogs. Barrio, 
The cholo gangsters who lived next door would show us small kindnesses when we were kids. Chupa chups and folded tortillas, we were like family. My braids like black whips, my brother dancing in his wind pants. So when I first heard gunshots and smelled marijuana, the cholos hollering in a white moon, moon-faced and mixed like dogs battling for ground, I felt the child's pang of fear, as now I hate the chareada. Swing, then chase, then terror, rope, and drag. The next two are about my great-great-grandmother and three greats-grandmothers. Magdalena. Many roses ring in the stalactite desert, make homes where strange lizards go. Yours is smoldering where the white shoulder touches ground, violent like acacia, romance of the rippled dirt and wrinkled rock. How could sand with its limping, unending memory lose its temper so and make such lush, abandoned scenery glow? Chapita, eye of nail, twisted crow, tongue and white light, old as stone, manto negro, flat on air and sandaled foot on dirt floor, black, black hair and aging sun, acer masa, floss of corn silk, chicken neck and wing and bone, tequila, stove and dust of snow, outhouse in the wretched star and gnarled knuckle, writing, trucking, Juarez, Texas, home. Little Cross. They said that he drank, and so I found his grave. Jutting from sand like a bat swing, tin burnt green in the sun that comes from Mexico. Oh, lowly brush fires, Tio Francisco, who holds the child where the land flattens into this dismal smoke. Who could sleep in this heat, in this dazzled folkland of skeletons? I dreamt the mountains and the beast in the mission and the cat's eye dangling from its wet socket. The transparent soul of a child. Roadrunners run here. Irene, and this one's about my grandmother. Some creatures have the light of the mountain, purple of the valley where the valley becomes beautiful. Kala, crocus, cowl of the coyote with her year of lost infants and madness, rattling belly in the sad wind. There is a thunderstorm of heartache to bear. There is a river that no one can cross. There are livers aflame in the wild lands and yet you walk in the simple light, yet you breathe beneath the stars that love you, Irene. Juniper, sage, the pricking scent of cacti bleeding into soft earth, this your heart. Of the crosses, we never could find him holding our hats in the wind. Like a curse, you don't speak the name of the man who sent the bullet. As a woman, you grew to learn the white horses. The desert fills with their words, arroyo, rincon, spellbinding. The day they shot your brother, you took the wound inside like cactus gauze. You fell in the passion, feeling the little boy in the wet linen. The miracles, miracles, how mountains shiver. Even now you are a pearl, you're old, Anger courses down your toga, and a mission cannot save. The blood Christ never lifts a feather. Song at White Sands. This one's about White Sands, New Mexico, which is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. It's kind of like visiting another planet. Heat the giver, heat the taker, heat caresser and skinner. The oven unfolds, Dust hits you first. Is this the land where you came enchanted into being beneath this white gold disc? Earless lizard, bleach house, where were the dream monuments? Desert pine, ghostly yucca, brutal choya. The white sands roll on, dune after dune, whipping themselves.
purple heaven loss in your voice. Only gold speaks. I would stop talking of dreams, Okotio, stop walking myself through the sleep of my life where I fly, but I can fly here. The Great Choya for Sikh Stone, and this one's about my great grandfather. How did you bear it, the weight of the family, all the breaking wood? The wood is scented with time and scarred with the incisions. From the bedroom window, the Choya cactus may be seen. Scrawl of chalk stick, deep and ragged, shivering with its might. Please protect the ones I love. Light as an ofrenda, built with light, what cannot be saved, what is taken from us coldly. So that's how color, the raging of your battered hand, can sleep, can lie and become smoke. Choya, ugly, sharp and beyond pain, bearing the weight of sacred lives. Ranchito, sadness has no real name. And why does it suit some of us like turquoise, like the black ranchera? Being from the interior, the indigenous Mexicans trailed burning veils in the water, the whole crater a torch in love with itself, touching goodbye with its tongue. The night sky wet with tears, just another lying woman. Tumbleweed. Agave, agave blue, harsh, great-grandmother. The whipping at my back is unleashed of its Santa Fe crocuses. The white wind limps like the fox to his Aztec furnace. Bells rippling in the desert swells, violent eye of gnarl that also blesses. What is this place? You will leave never telling, a brush of sandscape and brutal thorn in your belt. And I just have two more short ones. Chili roasting. The devil spit is higher than I care to pray. The chilies dance in the pan, part of some fiery riddle or a listener, a feeler. Torturer, kiss me, wake up, we're burning. Voice of the oak, your calico skin, the silk aggression, magic grasses and stitches and black sleep. There are many ways to be haunted, body of beauty, your velvet fire. I never knew the way to find you was to bend into the flame. Thanks to you all for being here. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I don't think I could say it better than one of our audience members did when uh, they said that that was amazing. And some of the quotes are now just stuck in our bones. <laughs> I love that too. So now um, I would invite anyone in the audience to put some questions for our poets in the chat, but I thought I would kick us off with a question of my own. So as I'm sure some of you are aware, um, Emily Dickinson traveled very little in reality, but very broadly within the circumference of her poetry. And she even has a poem that begins, I never saw a moor, I never saw the sea, yet I know how the heather looks and what a billow be. So what I'm wondering is what is it like to write about a place that you've never been, or to write about a thing you've never seen, whether because it's fossilized and no longer living, or it's remote, or it's from a relative story. What are the poetic strengths about writing the imagined rather than the known? And I will open that up to any of you. Dennis, that's for you. For you too, I think. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, so I'll I'll admit it. I've never been to Antarctica, um, and and I think that's you know part of um, what's there in that question for me is is that 
Um, this is a space that I've entirely imagined and, and done some research on and read about and thought about. But the strange thing is how, you know, the space came from within me to some extent. And, um, and then it sort of met the place that was in the external world. And now that's not just the geographical place, that's the place that's been imagined by a bunch of other writers too, like Edgar Allan Poe and a lot of people following upon his first, uh, his only novel. Um, so there's all these imaginative representations of it. And I think what it's like to imagine a place into existence like that is, I thought I would feel some unsettledness with it. Uh, some uncertainty having not done the you know work of going there um, or had the opportunity to do it but I actually realized that there's it's sort of like this sacred moment before you encounter a place um, what you believe and imagine about it and so if you can kind of um, admit that or admit your own distance and admit the sort of power and accidents of your own imagination then you know you can kind of create this this new space and maybe make the actual space itself into a new being too. Maybe I'm just an apologist though, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm curious then, you know, what it, yeah, what it is like to write about a creature that you haven't been, for example, or to imagine yourself into the bone of an, of an animal. Well, I do have one poem in the collection where I'm talking to a trilobite uh, that died during the Permian extinction uh, and while we're really not, um, we're not bringing the, the oil from the Permian Basin directly from the trilobite's body, it's mostly organic. It's still imagined what it would feel like to be ri risen from the dead, made to rise from the dead um, for kind of an illicit purpose. And in the poem, I, I uh, directly apologize to the trilobite for the fact that we're just about to do that. And um, it, I don't know, this animal really did seem real from the fossil. Um, and I didn't even think about it till just now when you asked this question, how did it seem so real? And I think it's because if you know you're facing extinction and you know this creature faced extinction, there's really a common bond between you. Um, I was going to add too, Dennis, I'm glad you brought up Edgar Allan Poe because I know I told you, I mentioned to you all that I had a college professor who said she was afraid of Dickinson's poetry, that it's just so brilliant and so um, encompassing. And so for me, there's really this element of kind of like the speculative and supernatural to her writing um, in that she almost um, has kind of like a supernatural or superhuman perception and just like that staggering insight. And uh, I think it really defies like um, physics and it kind of defies human logic to a lot of way in a lot of ways and in a sense it's almost like the main poetry and that it kind of encompasses it all and I think you know like a lifetime could be spent trying to understand her and I don't know that it could be done. Speaking of defined physics I, you were talking um the, the end of the white sands poem it's I forget what the line is it's like this place I can fly. So yeah and I, I don't know it, it almost feels like that's you know, you're like defying physics, but like, that sounds like a place you've actually been. Right. So I don't know if it's like the converse of what we're talking about or. Or it can know. apply to all, you know, like once you kind of open yourself to, to that type of experience, it can, you can learn how to go there. Totally. So. Just going off of the, the, the trilobite, which is preserved, but is, it's no longer truly a trilobite. Um, poetry has the power to preserve the words on the page, and in those words, at least the impressions of a place or a time. So do you see your work as poets who are writing about natural subjects or habitats or including ecological imagery um, even in descriptions of your own families, as in some way intersecting with the work of activists or conservationists. And, and I'm curious um, if there are any particular ecological issues that you yourself are, are really passionate about that inform your work. Wendy, you should go first. <laughs> All right. Well, I realized that uh, 
that I'm just voicing our trauma. Um, after Trump was elected uh, and he undid the Paris Climate Accords and he just decimated all of our, the, all the small steps we had taken um, toward climate progress, I think that we were just collectively um, traumatized. And I didn't realize how much I was. And so in 2019 is when I wrote most of these poems. Um, but at the time also, uh, my son-in-law was working uh, against establishing, uh, changing a, nu a nuclear power plant to a fracking plant in New York state. And he knew that um, once this transformation was made and it became a place where fracking the process of fracking could could take place, not the actual mining of the oil, but the processing of it. Um, he knew that 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 this was going to perpetuate for years because once you've invested all this money in something, you you don't want to just give it up. And so he and others were wa working so hard not to have this transformation take place. And um, I do feel that um, poets. And he said to me, "We need more poets. It's a hard fight." and we need some relief. Um, and from my own perspective, I spend a lot of time thinking about these types of things um, from like a vegan perspective and animal rights perspective. It's kind of all I think about some days uh, where I think it's so important that we're all actually facing our consumption habits and really thinking about how we're interconnected. And so I think, being vegan and thinking about how we live can not only impact our environment and what we, the way we treat animals, but I really think can change our whole perception. And it's a very um, encouraging and uplifting process that I've gone through personally. Yeah, and I'm hearing, I feel like this connection between the personal and the larger world in some of what we're saying. And it's something I think about with the Antarctica stuff too. Um, I'm aware they're writing imaginatively about a space whose destruction, you know, spells our destruction is, um, could seem sort of not properly urgent. Um, and, and I suppose I respond at least in my own heart in a similar way in that writing about people navigating an internal expanse is one way of doing the processing that we haven't done as human beings that would allow us to navigate the external expanses as well. So if you can cross kind of the Antarctica or live in that Antarctica in you, then you can find a way to preserve the one that's out there. And that is a grand goal for poetry and for literature. Um, but, you know, I, I suppose we are here to claim it. We, we need more poets. <laughs> Yeah. You took that to a, to a really deep place, Dennis, and I was just thinking about how traveling to Antarctica by reading your book would be much more sustainable than <laughs> traveling to Antarctica, in fact. Um, so it's an interesting line there. Well, we are almost um, at time, so I just want to send a tremendous thank you again oh we did have a question in the chat you know what um i will take that because we love getting questions from the chat and i i would love to to offer this to you just notice that now thank you um as poets who write and speak about political topics and topics that are so important living in these times do you ever get overwhelmed with how much there is that should be addressed and, and of course, we've been talking about ecological issues, but this could go into other realms that your poetry addresses. Well, to the question of do, do I get overwhelmed, uh, I have to close the door to the room that I write in. Um, I mean, I draft outside, the, I, I, I draft poems outside when I'm observing things, but then to, to work on them, I just come inside and I close the door. And you have to feel that you're doing something you really love to do and that it's important just to keep that energy and love alive. Um, it's so easy to get overwhelmed as everyone can tell you. And the pandemic I know has been hard on writers as a community. Um, so I feel lucky that, um, 
that I've been able to write. I think my intuitive response to that question is, is first to completely validate that feeling because overwhelm is the reigning emotion of most of the people I talk to these days and you can't hold everything you know and we're sort of expected to because we have access to so much um, and at the same time you know poetry can be a compartmentalized space and a place where you go for refuge and I think it can also be a place to bathe in the overwhelm and to allow the world to kind of flood through you if you can manage it um, and you know I think for me when I'm at my best I'm, I'm like, okay, Antarctica, it's not just about ecological disaster. Um, it's not just about, you know, finding oneself in the expanse. It's, um, you know, about the sort of um, racialized whiteness that is talked about a little bit more in the book itself. And it's about living in domestic spaces and it's about love and it's about other people. Um, and, and there's almost this, um, once the poems are there, they, they can kind of act as this conduit for, for all that information for me. And, and I can allow all this stuff into them. Um, not gonna say that that happens when I'm writing them. I'm probably a lot more like WJ, but I feel good when it opens up and when it lets, lets the world in. And I can just add briefly, I always take a lot from um, Dr. Jane Goodall, whose favorite quote from Deuteronomy is, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. And I think that, you know, these are our times, these are the stories of our lives, um, these are our causes and our loves, and we just have to be up to it every day. And um, I think it's all that way for, for some reason. Thank you. And I love that we got to ask that question because I feel like we kind of moved into a heartening and, and possible space together at the end of our program. Thank you again to our poets this evening for sharing of your worlds and your work. Uh, thank you again to our listeners for sharing your time and affirmation. And you can uh, purchase books from these poets. They're available at Amherst Books and Brooke is going to put amherstbooks.com in the chat for us. That is our local bookseller, but you can purchase them at a local bookseller uh, near you. And I also want to share some exciting news with you. So our September phosphorescence reading is coming up. That will feature poets who have published with The Common, a literary organization and publication based out of Amherst College. And we will be hearing from some fantastic, from some fantastic poets, including Chloe Martinez, Rodney A. Brown, Elizabeth Metzger, and Muriel Rothman Zecker. And this reading will be a part of our upcoming Tullet Slant Poetry Festival, which will take place September 20th to 26th. Uh, Burke is going to put the link to the festival schedule for you in the chat. Um, and, and go to this link to learn more. You can view the full lineup and find registration information. You'll be able to join us for a fabulous uh, free week of poetry and community, including readings, workshops, and panels. And some highlights include a headlining reading by former Poet Laureate Tracy K. Smith and Tiana Clark on September 25th, as well as as a week-long marathon reading of all 1789 Dickinson poems. So we hope to see you there and thank you and take care everyone. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thank you.